Welcome back to the Georgia Tech um, Neuro Seminar Series. First, a quick announcement. The uh, Neuro Next initiative here is going to have our kickoff day on August 25th in the evening with Rhi Costa coming to give our um, guest lecture and of October, yes, of this month, it's this month now. Um, thank you. And um, and then uh, on the 26th will be our kickoff day. And so um, you should have all gotten emails about that. If you haven't gotten an email about that and would like to participate, please come see me or Chris or Sarah up here and, and uh, we can give you more details on how to sign up. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Brad Dickerson. Uh, Brad got his undergraduate degree in biology from Swarthmore before he worked uh, with Ty Hedrick at UNC and then came as a graduate student to the University of Washington where I got to overlap with him in the lab of Tom Daniel for a while while I was a postdoc there and he was a graduate student. Um, he then won multiple fellowships to go work with Michael Dickinson at Caltech for his um, postdoc uh, work. And uh, before he even got done with those fellowships, UNC snapped him up uh, again, and he went back to UNC for his faculty position. But then two years into that, he got poached by Princeton. So uh, a, a record of extreme success here. But the thing that I really want to say about Brad is when uh, he's an incredibly broad thinker, and I've always really enjoyed my discussions with Brad. He's one of those people I try really hard to listen to. I encourage you all to try and do that today, too. Whenever I get Drosophila envy in my work, it's not for folks who are necessarily just generating the tools. It's people like Brad, who I think are asking really profound questions by leveraging all of those really amazing tools. And so we'll hear a little bit about that today as we go along. So Brad, thanks for coming. Please take it away. Oh, thank you. That's a very kind introduction, Simon. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And I look forward, I've already had some really, really nice conversations already. I look forward to talking more with uh, a few of you later today. All right. So what I want to do is tell you a bit about the work that we do um, in the lab. And I'm actually from the Princeton area. So I was about to say what we do at home, and it'd be appropriate in a few different ways. But first, what I want to do is kind of frame the work that the lab does. And the way I like to think about our work is that animals are both stable and maneuverable. And that's true across uh, different styles of locomotion. So whether we're talking about this lemur jumping through the forest or this top-down view of a hummingbird, in both cases, we see that you know, these animals can both navigate really complex environments and they can also execute these kind of really subtle diff changes in, in locomotion to you know, maintain uh, you know, sp specific body postures while they're they're moving around. And another thing that's really important in this case, in, in these two cases, is that we're talking about very, very different time scales, right? Because this hummingbird's flapping its wings at like 25 times a second. Now, timing is also really important for the nervous system. Um, and we've identified in a few different cases circuits for detecting timing differences at the um, nano or microsecond time scale to execute different kinds of complex behaviors, whether we're talking about hunting in the case of barn owls or echolocating bats or um, detecting conspecifics in the case of weakly electric fish. And um, in the case of detecting timing differences, we, we find a couple of things um, in those cases for these, for these kinds of circuits. First, we see that there are all sorts of biomechanical filters um, that help, you know, help with collecting information about the sensory environment. So in the case of barn owls, the, the ears are actually at different heights of the head to aid in detecting interoral timing differences so that the animal can detect where in azimuth um, a mouse is. And the other thing is that um, sensory information tends to be organized in maps. So in this case, this is the cricket circle system, and they can detect uh, wind, both direction and velocity really, really sensitively. And that information gets kind of made into um, a map in the central nervous system. And focusing on maps, those maps can come in kind of two broad flavors. So topographic maps, were, which are just kind of basically information laid out in space, like this recent work in the case of um, fruit fly eye and detecting like looming. But also um, in the case of going back to barn owls, we have this case of computational maps where sensory information is rerouted for based on some computational principle for the central nervous system. Okay. But everything I've just told you about is in the case of sensory systems and um, something that we're beginning to appreciate more and more. And this is work that um, both a couple of people in the audience, Lena Ting and Simon have have brought up is the role of timing in the motor system, right? And so we're beginning to appreciate more and more the role of sub millisecond timing differences in the case of bird song, in the case of human motor control, and um, my favorite study system, insect flight. Okay. 
And I used to work on moths, and that's where Simon and I met. But what I wanted to do today is talk to you a bit about um, this kind of problem of bridging the, the gap between timing differences in sensory and motor control and maps and biomechanical filters um, in, a, in a specific case of insect flight, which is uh, fly flight. And so this is a high-speed video of a hoverfly out in Washington State. And there are a couple of things I want to want you to appreciate. First is that you know this is happening very, very quickly. This animal is beating its wings about 200 times a second. And so it has to rapidly collect sensory information from its environment and turn it into changes in wing stroke on a you know on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And the other thing is that you know this animal can do all sorts of crazy maneuvers, right? So this animal is both very, very stable, right? Because it can just hover in place, but it can also execute these rapid kind of changes in in behavior. So I think so for me, fly flight is a really nice system to, to explore all these different problems together. Okay. But as much as I would like to work on hoverflies, there, there are a number of ways that they're less convenient to work on. So I work on fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, and there are a couple of reasons that Drosophila are a good system for studying this problem, right? They, they already fly, right? They're called flies, but we also have the benefit of the, the genetic toolkit in Drosophila for labeling and manipulating different uh, cell types. So this is just a confocal micrograph um, labeling the, the wing steering muscles that I'll talk about in a little bit with GFP, right? So we can label and man manipulate different cells, to turn them on and off as we see fit. But the other thing that's really nice about flies is that they fly well in a laboratory setting. So this is a setup that is very common in, in my lab where we have a fly tethered to a pin and then we place it in between an infrared LED and a pair of photodetectors. And so what we can do is in real time track wing motion and then also use that output to control a visual display where the fly is basically playing a video game and it can operate in either closed loop where it has control over its sensory experience or, it, um, or we can just play some kind of open loop sensory stimulus and see how the animal responds. And so let me just show you what this looks like. So in this case, we have the fly that's tethered right here and you can kind of see the, the change in, in the wing stroke envelope. And the, in this case, the difference in left minus right wing stroke amplitude is controlling the angular velocity of the stripe here. And so this is a really powerful method for really just uncovering you know, how an animal turns sensory information into behavior. And what we can further do is with the, uh, with the genetic tools available in Drosophila, we can start to untangle what's going on more mechanistically. Okay. So, Unlike other flying animals like birds and bats, flying insects, all the power and control for flight resides in the animal thorax. And so they have these large power muscles for flapping the wings, but they have a set of uh, small steering muscles on the lateral walls of the thorax that control the subtle maneuvers that, um, that I'm, I'm more concerned about. And they attach these, these uh, cuticular elements in the thorax called sclerites. You could think of them as kind of tendon-like elements that help reconfigure the wing hinge to uh, change wing motion and aerodynamic forces. And there are four major sclerites that, that we're concerned with, the basilar sclerite, the first axillary, the third axillary, and the fourth axillary, which for historical reasons right. is called the HG. And each of these uh, sclerites has a set of uh, steering muscles associated with it that attach to it. So there are a couple of things I wanna to bring to your attention. First is just that there aren't very many muscles here, right? We're, I'm talking about 12 muscles total. The other thing is that each of these steering muscles is innervated by a single motor neuron, right? So compared to uh, vertebrate motor control systems, you just have one motor neuron for, for each muscle in this case. So one, one question that kind of motivates our work is how is it, you know, you see flying insects execute all these very graceful maneuvers, but they're doing it with a very limited set of um, basically control knobs. So how are they gonna be able to accomplish that? Okay. So the wing steering system can be broken down anatomically, but we can also further break it down um, functionally. And there are two major flavors of uh, steering muscles for flies. We have muscles that are said to be tonically active. So in this case, flies are beating their wings at about 200 times a second or, or even more in some cases. And they don't have really the ability to, to modulate the spike rate of those neurons. What they can do instead is change when in the stroke cycle those muscles are active. So these muscles fire at a pre precise time or phase in the stroke cycle. Um, and so by introducing what's called a phase delay or a phase advance, we know from biomechanical analyses that this changes the mechanical properties of the muscle. 
and these muscles that are tonically active are more involved in relatively slow stabilization reflexes. And then the other flavor are muscles that are a little bit more intuitive that, and they're called physically active, um, where they're typically inactive, but then they come on in bursts and they're more involved in active maneuvers. But in both cases, when in the stroke cycle these muscles are active is really important because phasic muscles, they still, even though they fire in a burst, they only fire once per wing stroke. So when in the stroke cycle these muscles are active really determines how the wing hinge is reconfigured to change wing motion and aerodynamic forces in the fly's trajectory. All right, so timing is, is really important. So how do flies control timing of the wing steering system? Oh, oh and, one, and one other thing I should point out that's really important for stuff I'll talk about later is that if you look at... Um, steering muscle activity as a function of the turn magnitude, you see that muscles that are tonically active are kind of, they function as a knob, they're kind of linearly recruited, whereas muscles that are physically active are non-linearly recruited. But in both cases, timing is really important. Okay, so apologies that that flies a little light, but what you can imagine is if we're recording from a wing steering muscle motor neuron and we're getting, and in this case, we're recording from a tonically active muscle that's firing once per wing stroke at a precise time in the stroke cycle, the easiest thing you can imagine is that there's some descending ear neuron from the brain providing input to determine this, um, to, to, to determine this output. And there's certainly descending ear neurons that provide input to, um, to the wing steering system, but none of them fire in a phase lock fashion. Instead, they all <laughs> actually show graded changes in membrane potential that are more consistent with the spike rate code. So the idea for a long time has been that what, what flies do is actually combine visual input with rapid wing beat synchronous mechanosensory feedback that's arriving wing stroke to wing stroke to both structure and adjust um, the timing of the wing steering system. Okay, so one thing that's nice about this is that there are certainly um, mechanosensors on the wings that provide feedback on a wing stroke to wing stroke basis. But in terms of adjusting the wing stroke, there's something a bit problematic about using wing beat synchronous feedback only from the wings, which is that the feedback from the wings is always telling you basically about what the, the wing did in that, that current wing stroke. You can't change the feedback from the wing because this feedback is the direct output of the wing steering system. So if the fly wants to adjust mechanosensory feedback rapidly to change the motor output, relying on the, the wing um, mechanosensors alone isn't going to cut it. This is where flies being flies is really um, helpful because flies you may recall that, so compared to most flying insects which have four wings, flies only have two aerodynamically functional wings. And where they would have their hind wing, they have this structure here that I'm gonna spend basically the rest of my talk um, discussing, which is called the halt here. The halt here is essential to flight. If you cut it off, a fly can't fly. They can flap their wings, but they can't stabilize themselves, all right? So, <laughs> so one of the things that we know about, about the structure of the halt here is that it serves as a gyroscopic sensor, it detects body rotations. But the other thing about the halt here is that it's it's specific to flies. So basically anywhere that you, any any fly that you can think of, so whether you're thinking about mosquito, housefly, or drosophila, or horsefly, excuse me, or drosophila, they all have halt here, right? There's there's another group of insects, Strepsiptera, where they've where their front wings look like a halt here, but they're parasites and there's only one paper that where people have studied them and they're, it's an N of three. So we're just gonna focus on, on flies. Okay. Okay, so, so I mentioned that if you cut off the halt here's flies can't fly. And, and I said that, that the evidence suggests that halt here's are gyroscopic sensors. So what do I mean by that? So if we imagine that a fly is beating its wings back and forth in the halt here in the wing beat antiphase. And this dotted line just represents the tip path of the halt here. Let's just take, for example, a case where the fly gets rotated about pitch. So the halt here has a tendency to resist this change in its plane of oscillation. And so what's going to end up happening is its tip path trajectory is going to change and it's going to um, experience something called the Coriolis force, which is uh, equal to the cross product of the, the angular velocity of the fly's body about pitch in this case, and the um, tip velocity of the halt here. So this is a way for flies to detect both the direction of rotation and act the actual magnitude of rotation. Okay, so what's the evidence for this? So which, what we can do is build a simulator, a flight simulator. This is some previous work by my postdoc advisor called the rock and roll arena, where 
just as you might imagine, you, you can rock the fly around in about different axes. And so in this case, though, if we think about pitch, like I was saying before, what we can do is see with an intact fly, we get these changes in wing stroke amplitude that are compensatory. And if you re remove the halteers, then the fly can't, can't compensate. Okay. All right, so the halteer is a gyroscopic sensor. And if we take a closer look at the halteer, this is a confocal micrograph of a Drosophila halteer labeled with GFP. We see these, these rows and rows of these sensors. These are mechanic sensors called campaniform sensilla. They detect strain um, on the exoskeleton and in really anywhere on insects that you'll find bending and twisting, you'll find campaniform sensilla. So legs, uh, in some cases antennae, the wings, and in the case of flies, halteers. So the way these work is um, you have this dome-shaped structure that's embedded in spongy tissue. And so when the exoskeleton bends and twists, this cap that's attached to some connective tissue that's connected to the dendrite, it rises and falls, and that opens up mechanosensitive ion channels, and then you get the firing of an action potential. And so the wings also have these sensors, and that's consistent with the idea that the halteers are evolved from the hind wing. But the other thing is that another, another idea that un, or observation that underscores the halteers evolutionary history as a hind wing is that it also has a, a power muscle and a set of steering muscles. And we don't need to get caught up in the names. I just want to, we can just break them into two major groups, more anterior basilar muscles and the more posterior axillary muscles. So the halteer is a gyroscopic structure, which helps fly remain stable. But this reflex is very, very sensitive and presents a problem, which is that how can flies execute any kind of maneuver if they are constantly triggering this reflex, right? And we know from some previous work that the halteer muscles receive visual input, and this may be a this system may be a way that flies can be both maneuverable while maintaining stability. Okay, so that kind of sets up, you know, the, the rest of the work that that um, I want to talk to you about that we're doing in my lab. So, and we're going to frame it under this question of how animals maneuver without sacrificing stability. And we're going to think about the halteer in three different ways. First. We're going to think about the role of the halteer motor system in flight, because if the halteer motor system is active in some way, that could mean that the halteer is not just a passive gyroscopic sensor. Instead, it's a multifunctional sensory organ. And then we're going to think about if that's the case, how is the multifunctionality of the halteer achieved? And then finally, think about um, how feedback from the halteer is essentially organized um, in the central nervous system or organized in the central nervous system. All right, so let's start here. Okay. So, so just to restate what I said a little bit more formally, just a couple of slides ago, if we imagine a fly is flying and it's receiving visual input, that information can be sent to the halteer muscles, which could change the motion or mechanics of the halteer in some way. And because the halteer has a bunch of mechanic sensors embedded within it, that would change the mechanic sensory feedback arriving on a wing stroke to wing stroke basis. And because the halteer has a direct excitatory connection with at least one of the wing steering muscles, that would change the timing or activation of the wing steering system, which would change conformation of the wing hinge, wing motion, aerodynamic forces in the fly trajectory. And this is something that, that I'm gonna call the control loop hypothesis. And, and so this section, I'm, I'm just, this, this is already published. I'm gonna condense a lot of work into just a couple of slides, but this makes three, three predictions. The first is that, excuse me, the halter muscle should be under visual control. Right? The second is that what we should be able to do is just present visual input to the fly and see that that the mechanical sensory feedback from the halt here is modulated. And so we, we, in, importantly, we're not going to rotate the fly. We're going to have the fly still and then ro rotate the visual world and see how the halt here responds. And then finally, we should be able to activate the halt here steering muscles and see changes in the activity of the wing steering muscles. Okay. So this is where um, using, using Drosophila genetics can be really, really helpful. Because one of the challenges with studying the halt here is that it's a very small structure and it's, it's beating up and down you know, 200 times a second. So what we can do, so something I did was take advantage of the fact that when motor neurons excite muscle, you get this big burst of calcium. And so in this case, what I could do is express a genetically encoded calcium indicator in the halt here steering muscles, and then using an epifluorescent microscope, just image halt here muscle activity directly through the cuticle while the fly is tethered and flying and present different kinds of visual motion. And there's no dissection here. So the fly is tethered and it's doing what it wants. And I can image um, halteer muscle activity. Okay, so I just want to show you a quick video of this, in this case. So here are the basilars, here are the axillaries, and I'm imaging the left 
wing, left halter muscles, um, and reporting the left wing beat amplitude. And so when the world rotates to the left, the fly is going to follow the motion. So left wing beat am amplitude decreases, and you can see that in both cases, muscle activity increases. All right, and fantastic. Halter muscles are, are active and under visual control. Now, the next thing, the next part of this is, is looking at, well, if that's the case, we should see changes in, in sensory activity from the halter nerve. So this is a dissected fly nerve system. So here's the brain, the cervical connective, and the ventral nerve cord. And these two large tracks running up to the, bit, the brain are the primary afferents of the halter, right? So they're, they're huge. And, and importantly, at this region of the brain, the subesophageal zone, you have these large axon terminals. And so using um, two-photon laser scanning uh, microscopy, what, what we can do is, again, express a genetically encoded calcium indicator and then record calcium activity while the fly is tethered and flying. But importantly, the fly is, is rigidly stuck. So I'm going to show you another video where, in this case, this is the right halter axon terminals and looking at the right wing beat amplitude. So again, the world's moving to the left. So now wing beat amplitude increases on this side. And there are a couple of things I want to point out. First is before the stimulus comes on, there's a baseline level of activity, which is consistent with the idea that the halter is beating up and down and providing rhythmic feedback to the halter. But then when the world appears to, to rotate and the fly steers, if, so if the halter were merely a passive gyroscopic sensor, shouldn't see any change in fluorescence activity, right? But you can see that there's an increase in activity, which is consistent with the idea that the halter muscles in some way are changing um, motion or mechanics. And I also did some experiments on doing the same experiment on the wing uh, sensors and saw the same thing. So that gives us some sense that what is happening is halter motion. And, I'll, and so hold that thought. I'll get back to that in a little bit. And then the last thing is that we should be able to activate halter muscles record from the wing steering system and see a change in activity. And so using um, what's called split GAL4, uh, split GAL4 driver lines, which selectively label like basically individual cells in this case. Um, in this case, I'm labeling these two halter steering muscle motor neurons. You can optogenetically activate these with red light. Flies can't see red light while we're recording electrophysiologically from the wing steering muscles and see any changes in activity. So let me give you an example of this. So in this case, we're recording from a, a muscle that's tonically active. And so these are muscle action potentials overlaid for multiple wing strokes. And you can see that's firing you know, really precisely at, at a specific time in the stroke cycle. Now, when I just activate these two, um, these two motor neurons, which are really, really small, we get this, a phase advance, right? It's firing earlier in the wing stroke cycle. And we can also look at a phasically active muscle and see that we get recruitment, right? And activating a different a different set of um, steering muscle motor neurons. And recording, again, from that same tonically active muscle I showed you, we get a phase delay. So just by activating four motor neurons, we can recapitulate all the modes of control that flies have over the wing steering system. But importantly, we're not looking at the wings, we're not, we're not activating wing muscle motor neurons, we're activating a different set of motor neurons. Okay. So the basic idea is that the halt here is not just a gyroscopic sensor. It's also a sort of adjustable timing mechanisms where visual information is coming through. It's sent to the halt here muscles, which is changing the motion or mechanics of the halt here, changing the mechanics sensory feedback on a stroke by stroke basis, and then changing the timing or activation of the wing steering system. Okay. And the other thing that we think is this, this idea of the halt here detecting gyroscopic forces, the Coriolis force, may be an epiphenomenon that kind of takes advantage of this basic reflex. All right. So that establishes for us that the halt here is a multifunctional sensory structure. So now what I want to do is think about how that could even be achieved, right? And this is work by um, most of this, well, most of what I'm going to talk about is work by postdoc in my lab on a verb. Okay. So I mentioned that halt tiers have these mechanical sensors called companiform sensilla. And, and like I said earlier, you can find them on different parts of Insects. So this is from a robber fly halt here. This is a stick insect leg, and this is a moth wing. And one thing that's really important, this is actually something that I did with Simon during the pandemic, is Simon came to me with this, this interesting idea of, well, 
you know, we we have this we have this sense from um, from using band limited Gaussian noise uh, experiments that companion forms in scylla exhibit this what's called what we call derivative pair feature detection. And if you use a model Hodgkin Huxley neuron, you get the same kind of dynamics out, which gives us a sense that fundamentally the neurons underlying these companion forms in scylla are very very simple. And really, what matters in terms of how they encode information is how many you have and where you place them. The local biomechanics matter matter the most. Okay. So now thinking more specifically about the halt here and its role as both a gyroscopic sensor and um, and transducing these halt here motor commands. All right. So I showed you this before, and and what we know about the halt here is that you have these different uh, regions of of sensors that are that have distinct morphology. So these are scanning electron micrographs from different uh, families of flies. And so this region on the stalk, you know, you can see that they all have this distinct morphology that kind of looks like the body of an accordion where they're kind of fused row by row. Excuse me. And this region at the base, which is kind of the business end of the gyroscopic sensing, um, they have this more oval shape, but again, you see this kind of row by row. So having so many of them gives you additional sensitivity, but you can also see that the morphology you can see that how the morphology could definitely make a difference in terms of um, what kind of information is relevant um, to these regions. And you can take it one step further and look at the mechanical transduction channels underlying these um, companion forms and see that the ones along the stalk are aligned with the long axis of the, of the halt here. And so the, the idea for a long time has been that they're detecting in-plane bending while the fly is uh, flapping the halt here, whereas these ones at the base maybe are they're aligned off axis and maybe more primed to detect shear strains associated with either gyroscopic forces or these muscle commands. Okay. So we have some hypotheses about how these might work, but again, testing this is difficult because it's, we're talking about a moving structure. The cell bodies are on the halt here, right? So how are we going to, how are we going to test this out? And importantly, this is a thing, you know, because I, I work under Sofla, there aren't specific, driver lines to label just this region or just that region. So we need a, a different approach. Okay, so I had this idea that maybe what we could do is go back to this method of imaging directly through the cuticle because these sensors are so superficial and there's so many of them that you might be able to use a calcium indicator and just see it directly. And this is, this is, this is what Anna does. Um, so she, She's got a fly tethered here. She can track wing motion using a um, using a camera, and we also have a camera for imaging from the halt here. So importantly, the fly is flying, and in this image, it looks as though the halt here is just stuck in downstroke, right? Um, but something that we're also doing is we're tracking wing motion using infrared infrared LED and photo detector pair, and this gives us a real time measurement. And what we can do is 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 prescribe when the stroke cycle we want the camera shutter to be open so that we only see the, the halt here in downstroke. Okay, so we can image from the halt here while the fly is flying. And what we can also do is see these two different regions. We've got the base and we've got the stalk of the halt here. And we're just looking at the dorsal side. Okay, so if we do that, we'll be, we'll be fine just by, by doing this kind of simple experiment is that both regions are, are slightly to my surprise, but in some ways, it makes a lot of sense. They're both continuously active, and they, so they have a mean level, a mean kind of baseline level of fluorescence, and they fluctuate about that that level. And that, you know, in many ways, this makes good sense because they're mechanical sensors. They're they're sensitive to nanometer scale deflections, and this thing's swinging up and down, 180 degrees, 200 times a second. Okay, but now what we can do is say, all right, we can image from the halt here. Can we understand how it's encoding visual information to control uh, different flight behaviors? Okay, so in this case, what I'm going to show you is we're going to we're going to present the world rotating around the animal in different axes, and I'm going to show you the left minus right wing beat amplitude and the change of fluorescence, just as an example for this region at the base. So in this case, what we've got up top is the arrows indicate using the right hand rule the direction of rotation around the fly, and so we can see that you know just as you would expect the fly is sensitive to different, this is the left minus right, so you can see that the fly is sensitive to different um, changes in, in visual motion, right? And what we can also do is then these dotted lines represent 
when the stimulus is on. So we can just sum those and just you know get a nice tuning curve and also put it in the polar plane, right? And so that that's exactly what you'd expect. And what we find with um, the halt here sensory fields is that they are also tuned and they're tuned in the same direction as um, as the uh, as wing motion, which is nice because because the work I showed you previously looking at um, mm -hmm. looking at the halt here axon terminals, we saw something similar, right? So it's it's nice to see that at the cell bodies, right, we're seeing something similar. And you know, looking at the other region of the halt here again, we see that they're also tuned. Okay. So halt here motion is is directly directionally tuned now. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the halt here has a has a direct excitatory connection to at least one or two of the wing steering muscles. And if we go back to this idea that the, the wing steering system is functionally stratified, right, where we have these tonically active muscles that are more important for relatively slow and visually mediated stabilization maneuvers, and these physically active muscles, I told you that visual input primarily modulates these muscles and that they're, they're linearly recruited. So something that we asked is, is there similar kind of functional stratification in the halt here system? And so what we did is we took the, the data from the tuning experiments, and then we just sorted them agnostic of direction based on the, the strength of the response. So from the most rightward to the most leftward turns. And so when we do that, we get something that looks like this, where each row is a different trial, and the color encodes the, you know, the, the strength of the turn. And then what we can do is um, sort these into deciles and plot the decile means, again, color-coded, and then plot basically during the during the stimulus being on, you know, how how strong of a turn we get, right? Great. And so if we do this for our different companion fields, we get this kind of this nice but and and surprising more linear relationship between between the strength of the turn and um, and fluorescence, which gives us some sense that that wide field visual motion is linearly recruiting halter feedback. Okay, so that's that's interesting. The other thing to keep in mind is that flies execute these active maneuvers that we call saccades, body saccades. And the halt here has been implicated in, in stopping these saccades because, again, the halt here is, at, is definitely a passive gyroscopic sensor. But it's unclear how the halt here could be involved in their initiation, right? But one thing that's very convenient about saccades is that they're not just present during uh, free flight, they're also present in tethered flight. And they're ballistic. So we can what we can do is during tethered flight, look for these kinds of behaviors and then see how the halt here is or is not active um, during these kinds of maneuvers. Okay. So again, this is basically finding those saccades and then sorting them based on the strength of the turn. And we can do the same thing with the fluorescence record. And now we can see again, we get this kind of smooth control over wing motion which is exactly what you'd expect, like right, a fly can turn to the left or to the right. But now what we see is that in both cases, we get linear or nonlinear recruit, we get lin nonlinear recruitment in both cases, yeah. right? And also importantly, you can see that the halt here signal is active before the fly actually turns, right? Which is pretty, pretty surprising, it was pretty surprising to me and very exciting to me. Okay, but I told you at the beginning that fundamentally the, the sensors, the companion forms in cell are really just generic Hodgkin Huxley neurons. So how can we get this, how can we get this linear nonlinear relationship, right? Well, the something I thought about is, well, this is re very reminiscent of what we see in the wing steering system. And the halt here has a set of muscles. So maybe there's functional stratification in the halt here steering system that could explain what we see here. Okay. And so we can record from the, the halt here muscles, this is just another example of that, and then look for these saccades mm -hmm. while we're recording from the halt here muscles. And now in this case, what we see is, again, if we if I look at left minus right wing beat amplitude, right, we get smooth control over wing motion. But now looking at one group of muscles, the basilar muscles, we get this linear recruitment. We also get nonlinear recruitment. And to put a point on it, we get, we have muscles that are tonically active and muscles that are physically active. Okay. So now what this allows us to do is ask, okay, we have, we have functional stratification in the steering system that may be functionally stratifying the, 
the actual sensors. But we can what we can also do is ask, is there a way that is there a way that we can understand how these muscles are actually actually controlling halt here motion to achieve the stratification? Okay. So now I want to think about how could we how could the fly potentially control halt here motion? So one potential hypothesis is that basically what's happening is that the halt here muscles mimic the effect of the Coriolis force. Okay. And so again, just to remind you, if we've got the halt here stroke plane and now we rotate about the yaw axis, so we have some angular velocity omega, and we have the end knob velocity, the cross product of the angular velocity with the, the knob velocity is going to be the Coriolis force, and you'll get a change in trajectory, in this case, more of a figure eight pattern. But this is highly, highly exaggerated, because if you model this, this is the in-plane motion, this is the out-plane motion, and you can see that the out-of-plane displacement is uh, two orders of magnitude less than the in-plane motion, right? So the, the motion that you're expecting that we could potentially measure is on the order of one degree, which is, you can't measure that very well, right? But another alternative is I, I showed you that wing motion and the halt here sensors are tuned in the same direction. What I didn't tell you is that some work that I did previously found that the halt here muscles are also tuned to visual motion, but in the opposite direction. And that gives us the idea that, well, if the halt here sensors are tuned in the same direction, and we know from recording from the wing companiforms that, that um, increases in wing stroke amplitude lead to increases in calcium activity, this, this indicates that potentially what's happening is we're getting increase in halt here stroke amplitude. So maybe what the halt here muscles are doing is regulating stroke amplitude. And the, something else that's very convenient about finding out that the halt here muscles, at least some of them are physically active is that they're nonlinearly recruited, so they're more of a switch, which will, and we, what we can potentially do is optionally activate these muscles and then find, um, see how that might change halt here motion. Okay. So um, this, was a, this is something that started um, a collaboration with uh, a colleague of mine at Case Western Reserve and her student, Chris Leah, has been doing these experiments where she optionally activates the same motor neurons I showed you before that lead to changes in the wing steering system, a phase advance. But now what we're doing is just tracking halt here motion with a high-speed video camera. And if we do this, we see a decrease in halt here stroke amplitude. And this is a z-score, but just so you know, this is on the order of about 10 degrees, right? So it's a pretty significant drop in halt here stroke amplitude. All right. So what we think is going on is that you've got visual information sent to the halt here Companiforms are companiforms are companiforms. What really makes a difference is that you've got functionally stratified muscles that are regulating stroke amplitude for stabilization reflexes or active maneuvers. And that's changing the encoding of the halt here itself. Okay. So now we've got this multifunctional sensor, but this actually kind of presents a problem that I want to talk about now, which is how halt here feedback is essentially organized. And this is work by a grad student in the lab, Serene Dewan. Okay, so what I told you just, just a couple of slides ago is that companiform field activity is linearly and nonlinearly recruited, that's, and that's based on um, the functional stratification of the halt here steering system. But the first thing I showed you was that the companiforms are, are continuously active, right? And, and I also showed you this anatomy of the halt here nerve, right? And you have this big cable of information. How is, how is that information preserved as it enters the central nervous system, right? That's, that's not obvious. Okay, and so that's what, we, that's what I wanna explore in this last part of the talk. Okay, so we have some sense of the gross projection patterns of these different fields, um, these two fields that I've been talking to you about. And we know in one case, and in the case of the wing steering system and, and the halt here's relationship to the wing steering system, we know that it provides information to one of these muscles, uh, the B1 muscle. So this region here at the base provides information to B1 that helps increase wing stroke amplitude. But there are all these other ways that flies control wing stroke motion. And we have all these other companiforms and fields of companiforms. We don't understand if there's any sort of organizational logic uh, underlying, underlying the, the projection patterns. Okay. So one of the nice things about working in Drosophila is that there's a large community of tools available. Um, and so my colleague, John Tuthill and um, Wei-Yan Lee 
John's at University of Washington, Wei's at Harvard Medical School. They, they got together to, to collect this um, EM data set, the female adult nerve cord, where, where they have it's a serial EM and you can get a full reconstruction of, in many cases, whatever neuron you want of the, of the nerve cord, not the brain. A lot of people are, are doing that. And like I have colleagues at Princeton that, are, that have been doing that. Um, but just focusing on what I'm gonna call fan C, we're gonna reconstruct the, the halt here nerve and look at its relationship to the wing steering system. Okay. All right, so we can reconstruct the whole halter nerve and there are about 180 neurons in the halter nerve. And just to kind of emphasize how important the halter is to the fly, there are, about 100, there are about 14 inputs per neuron, all right? But there are about 400 output synapses per neuron, right? And this is kind of helpful bean counting, but what we can also do is, is since we have the location of these synapses, that can actually be a little bit more powerful because so in the case, so what Serene asked, I, I came to her with this project of, you know, can we organize, can we think about how halter information is organized? And we don't have the location of the halter sensors, right? But Serene came up with this clever idea. She was like, well, I can, I know the morphology of the of each neuron, and I have knowledge of the axon terminals. What maybe what I can do is I can subtract the backbone of the neuron and then just classify each neuron based on the morphology of its axon terminals, and then compare pairwise each neuron's um, morphology with one another and see if any kind of clusters fall out. And when she does that, she gets five different anatomical clusters, right? And so initially this was exciting to us because like, there, are, there are four major companion fields, a cortisonal organ that detects stretch in the halt here, that's five, you got five different regions here, maybe there's something to that. But I think the story gets a little bit more interesting, actually. So, so okay. So one thing is we just see that you know these kind of bundle together, and this is you know this is all done computationally. So seeing that these bundle or fasciculate together is good confirmation that these are real clusters. But the other thing that Serene does, is, so now I have those same clusters color coded, and we have the we have knowledge of the direct connections with the wing steering muscles. And so now what we can do is look muscle by muscle how if there are any sort of patterns that emerge from these different clusters. So when she does that, so it's exactly what she sees where, you know, in this case, this cluster seems to target these two muscles that, that both control wing stroke amplitude. You get this other cluster that gets a lot. So in this case, what I'm showing you is each column represents a different halter neuron and each row is a wing steering muscle motor neuron and the color indicates um, basically the, the intensity of the synapse. Um, or the number of synapses, right? And so a couple of things emerge here. So first is that we don't just target one anatomical group of muscles. We target our, all four sclerite groups, but also each group is targeting different kinds of muscles. So functionally distinct muscles. So muscles that are either linearly or non-linearly recruited. So it seems like the halt here is controlling basically all aspects of wing motion, but also controlling different both linearly and non-linearly recruited muscles. Okay, cool. The other thing that we can do is focus in on these three um, morphological subtypes and then look at any, um, so you know, look at, uh, the words are escaping me. Looking at a, a special inner neuron that gets information from these inner from these primary afferents and then directs it across the midline that I'm going to call wing contralateral halter interneurons. Okay, sorry about that. And these actually, so in this case, it's unique. These the reason I like to point these out is like in this this example again, going back to these two muscles that help increase wing stroke amplitude, they provide input that crosses the midline to control a steering muscle that helps decrease wing stroke amplitude, the, the antagonist, right? And, and this one also helps decrease wing stroke amplitude. Okay, so great. But the thing that's, that's missing is that, and this is ongoing work, is that we don't have the anatomical origins of these clusters, right? Because we, we're, we're not certain if, if these regions, if the morphological groups I'm showing you originate from these, from individual regions or if they're a mix, right? Because that, that would give us a sense of if there's really a computational map. And so 
we're using an, another method called X-ray nano holotomography, where instead of it gives us EM level re resolution, but, and we prepare a dissected VNC with the halt here attached, like you would for EM. But instead of slicing it, now we encase it in resin and ship it to some collaborators, Alex Pak Pakaranu at um, the European Synchrotron Facility in Grenoble. Now what we can do is get a nice reconstruction of the halt here, but also get reconstruction of the inside of the halt here, and then scan you know along the halt here nerve. Um, and so we're working on on reconstructing this right now. And so, but something else that Serene can do is again go back to Drosophila genetics and say, well, can I identify? Can I use genetic tools to basically recreate an anatomical cluster? So this is an example that she's where she's done this for for this cluster that labels these two that that targets these two motor neurons, where she can dissect, she can come up with a driver that seems to 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 look to to mimic the morphology, but the thing that's also powerful about this is that we can also dissect away the halt here and now, um, you know, get a sense of the locations on the halt here and see how that see how that pairs. So you know, these different methods will allow us to get a sense of how the information is organized from the periphery into the central nervous system. So what we think is going on is that it seems like information. We think that what's happening is that halt here information is being rerouted into these. In, into a kind of complicated map for the wing steering system, but you know we're still working on that. Um, but you know, thinking going back to kind of the major question and some of the major takeaways, I think first is we see that with the halt to your motor system, you've got sub millisecond control of the steering system, and that enables you know, high dynamic range via functional segregation of the motor system that functionally segregates the the companiforms, and then. And we think is happening is that you got these kind of local computational maps at motor targets. And finally, the the, the thing I, I just want to leave you with is I I brought this up you know early on that the halt here is multifunctional sensory structure, but another thing to keep in mind is that because the halt here has evolved from the hind wing, this kind of control loop idea is likely uh, based on a conserved hind wing circuit that you'd find across across um, flying insects. So with that. I want to thank the lab, um, funding collaborators like Simon, um, and take any questions that you've got. So thank you, Brad. We're going to ask that the first question come from a postdoc or a student. And we're quite patient, so we'll sit here in awkward silence until someone asks a question. Great. Um, it's still very similar, but you may have missed in the beginning. The whole theory is uh, you need both in the fly. I mean, ah, so this is this is an interesting thing. So to detect body rotations, you may only need one, especially given like the call tier and around I showed you. Um, in terms of do you need both to fly though? I don't know if anyone's actually tried that experiment. It's a very easy thing to do, but this also brings up another point, which is that. Um, so, you know, thinking about the halter, you have these ipsilateral projections and you have these contralateral projections. It's very similar to the, the organization of the vertebrate vestibular ocular reflex, where you've got um, ipsilateral contralateral projections that help control posture. Um, so it just, it just came to mind, but yeah, we're not certain, but um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. A question I had about the companion sensors on the hall tiers. You showed a diagram where it was connected to dendrite. The uh, force that activates that sensory transduction is that centripetal force, or what's the force that's like uh, opening? Oh yeah. So in the case of the mechanical trans, the mechanical transduction channels, it's the what you have is in it here. Let me go back to that. So. In many in many cases, uh, where are they? Sorry, yeah. So let's go here. So, what's happening is, like on the leg or on an antenna or on the wing, they're bending, and then this is rising or falling. In the case of the halt here, what ends up happening is the tip path trajectory changes, which changes like the you get these shear strains that develop, and that's going to squish. And stretch the exoskeleton, which is going to have the same effect, okay. right? So, so in this case, you've got the Coriolis force, which is changing the motion of the the apparent motion of the halt here, 
And so that's going to cause that dome to rise and fall and then open those ion channels. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes. Are there any mechanoreceptors in the muscles? Like, or... Uh, so in, in insects, no, but they have cortitonal organs that detect stretch. And uh, my colleague, John Tuttle, works on these in, in legs. Halt here also has one, but he's been doing a lot of work and there's a lot of work on locusts in those. And so what he's finding is that, and so that's actually a case also where biomechanics makes a big difference because what he's finding is that there are different functional groups, some that respond to like the, the full motion, like the leg position and changes in leg position. And so I think, you know, as someone as someone who knows him and has read the work, it seemed like what they thought was happening was that because they were genetically identifiable groups, that that there was um, that there were different differences in like the underlying like physiology of the neurons. But really, what what they found is that they each of those subgroups attaches by a tendon to this this structure in the leg called the arculum and they have different attachment points and so as the leg bends they, because they have different attachment points that pulls on them in different ways and so the biomechanics in that case also determines how they're encoding information so because they also did um, single cell rna sequencing and they found there are basically no real differences among those neurons which kind of underlies this point that for at least for insects or in these cases the underlying sensory neurons are just very replaceable, which is very, very convenient because then you can have many more of them and get additional sensitivity. And then if you're just changing how you hook them up. That's a lot easier than making new neurons with different um, sensitivities. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. So you talked about how the whole tier activity is correlated with future steering events. Yeah. And then in the movie, and, and we talked about it like cycle to cycle feedback, yeah. but in the movie, it looks like the halt tiers are going out of phase yes. with it. So, I mean, could it be a within stroke sensory prediction because they're leading with the um, with the lightning? Yeah, it's it's yes, it's it's definitely possible because what the halt tier muscles are doing is you know trimming halt tier motion very subtly, wing stroke to wing stroke, and yeah. So one thing that's difficult for us is that you know. Calcium imaging is powerful because we have access to, to systems that we haven't had access to. But what you'd really like to do is be able to record from these muscles electrophysiologically and get a sense of what's happening, you know, each wing stroke that we, and it's something that we just can't do. And so maybe vulture sensors will get good enough that we can do it in flies one day or. Yeah, but I mean, what's the current explanation for them going? Oh, oh, that's, that's mechanical. That's that, the idea there in terms of the phase relationship is that that's basically the, the mechanics of the thorax because not all flies um, have this 180 degree relationship. The phase relationship for a given fly is important for it, but it's not always 180 degrees because there are some flies that where it's like 90 degrees, some where it's zero, and that's determined by the, the, the mechanics of the thorax. But whatever the phase relationship is for that fly, it is really important. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the neural feedback compensate for the lack of hamper the mechanical connection between the, the wing and the thorax but can the neural control from the heart ear compensate for the damage of the mechanical connection? oh so you're saying like if you were to disrupt that yes. uh no i don't think it can because I, I, someone someone did these experiments a few a few years ago and that disrupts you know how the fly flaps its wing yeah um yes so can I take away a simple message that the maneuverability comes from the basic muscles and the stability comes from the tonic muscles? Yeah. Yeah, that control. And the, I'm going to follow up on that because I'm curious then if the segregation could also, you're suggesting that it comes somewhat from a connectivity mapping um, of the haltier fields yeah. to the muscles and this different sort of combinatorial yeah. combinations, right? The computationally, the difference between a tonic muscle and a phasic muscle could also be how much persistent excitatory current, like if you think of them as simple integrated fire muscle yeah. um, neurons or yeah. neurons or muscles, then the, the tonic ones just need a small shift to kick the phase, but the phasic muscles need to be like elevated above threshold and burst. Could yeah. you do it dynamically that way? 
or is that not sufficient to do the segregation? Well, yeah, so that's an that's an interesting question because because something also another way you could think about this is that you could imagine since there are so many descending inner neurons that get visual information, and I know that um, people are working on this and they're finding that there's also functional segregation there where there are inner neurons that are relatively slow and for stability and some that come on in bursts. But um, someone who was a grad student in the lab I was a postdoc in did some experiments where she optionally was activating those inner neurons and you would get, you could, you could kick the system, you could get phase shifts, you could get activation, but particularly with those phase shifts, they were nowhere near as strong as activating the halterior steering muscles. And so there's a there's a way for visual information to <laughs> that aid in that kind of adjusting the system. Like it it has to that has to be the case. But I think, and this is, gets back to the idea that the halterior and the control loop is a conserved hind wing, hind wing reflex which is that in moths and in locusts, we know from previous work, the hind wing provides really strong information to the forewing. And so the, what the halteer may be doing is really, you have the separation of labor between aerodynamic force production and then just timing, but this timing thing has a really strong influence on the wing steering system that you just can't eliminate because there's no reason for flies to need a halteer other than these kind of constraints of evolution, so. Has there been any experiments to genetically knock out the nanosensors on the hull tiers to know if it's like something other than that? Uh, so someone's actually doing this as we speak, not in my lab, but um, they are, they're finding that just basically as what you'd expect is as you remove more and more of these sensors and you rotate the fly, they become less and less sensitive to, to, um, to the Coriolis force. Was a question you mentioned that the 12 wing muscles are all controlled by the B2 motor neuron. Do you mean that all the 12 are controlled by the same neuron or that each muscle is controlled by its own B2? They're, they're all controlled by, they each have a single motor neuron. So they're, the names of them are, they, each muscle has a different name and there's an associated motor neuron for that, for that muscle. Yes, yeah, sorry. We you know uh, if we can do like a uh, knockout of some of the learning mechanisms, would that like tell us if this is uh, the halteris like compensatory action is like a learned behavior or do we know if it's like a inbuilt like within the genetic? I think I think the idea is that the halteris is pretty. And so one one thing that's important about the halteris is it's even though the the steering system gets visual input it's it's pretty it's pretty self-contained reflex it's pretty isolated from um the kind of like learning mechanisms that that flies have yeah yeah, yeah sure okay and we're at about 12 15 so we're going to wrap up and thank brad again for an excellent talk